Republicans, and I just want to make that very clear because there's never been a, a line, you know, that, that connection has never been made except over the last year on Fox News. They've been hearing that never, even though it's, I don't know of any instances of that. But what happened in Virginia, the um, uh, one of the gentlemen who was arrested at one of the school board meetings, you know, school boards have been out of control due to all this right wing push um, against the against coronavirus uh, mitigation and and now critical race theory. So they become violent and he got arrested. Well, now, then he said his daughter had been sexually assaulted in a bathroom at school by a boy wearing a skirt. And that boy was indeed found guilty of sexual assault, but no one has ever, uh, we don't know his gender identity and the trans access um, issue had not even been implemented in schools yet. Yet, so it's really quite irrelevant to the point that Republicans are trying to make, and yet it ties in very neatly for someone who was already arrested, um, you know, creating trouble as a right-wing activist at these school board meetings. Um, it fits in very neatly with the narrative that Fox News has been selling um, over this past year. So that's well, kind of what's happening. Okay, while we're on the subject, uh, Juan Williams, uh, who is a or was a commentator on Fox News Channel, uh, wrote a column in The Hill today saying that the call for parents' rights in Virginia uh, was essentially a racist dog whistle. What do you think of that? Oh, I think it is because, um, you know, they Republicans have been... I, let's, let's put context on this. This is not new, and it's not new to Trump. Republicans have been using Southern strategy to win elections for a very long time. But the way they get away with that is they find in each election a new issue that doesn't look like it's racist. So it's states' rights, and now here we are at parents' rights. That's what this, they've framed this whole thing about. One of their issues, for example, is they're very upset that um, kids in an advanced placement class are to read Toni Morrison's Beloved, which is a wonderful novel about the horrific repercussions of slavery. Uh, she's a Nobel Peace winner, so, you know, not exactly any kind of fringe. This is really good writing. I would want my kid to read this, but that's one of the In ads fact, they took she'd out. Say for the purposes of clarity that my daughter, who's a high school English teacher, uh, loves Beloved and uh, uses it frequently in her classes. It's a great, it's, I mean, she's an, an, an amazing author. Everyone should read her. Um, you want your kids to, I mean, why do we not want our kids to know history? Uh, Republicans are saying that they don't want their kids to feel guilty. Well, you know, I think that whole argument is, is specious on its face, but, you know, let's, I'll leave that aside just to get back to one of the things they, they're doing is running an ad in Virginia um, about, you know, Terry McAuliffe won't let parents have a say, and they're not saying what their issue is, but it's this book. And that's why it's racist, but the courts are not going to come out and admit what book it is, otherwise it looks very much like it's racist. And here we have, you know, uh, Youngkin, who says he would support Trump in the next election, trying to distance himself from Trump because Virginia is not keen on Trump, and Biden won Virginia by almost a nearly 10 percentage points. point. So, um, you know, obviously Youngkin's trying to distance himself, but he looks to be very much a Trump candidate. I don't know anyone. I think we could put on a, a handful of Republicans who are not uh, showing themselves to be willing to become Trump candidates at some point. Yep, they've all drunk the Kool-Aid. Uh, Sarah, we're going to go to a break now. When we come back, well, we will have more with Sarah Jones, Editor-in-Chief of Politicus USA, uh, to talk more about the Virginia governor's race and also the uh, Supreme Court uh, case uh, on the draconian Texas abortion law. We'll be back right after these messages with more of Deadline hey, D.C. Welcome back to Deadline D.C. with Brad Bannon. Our guest in this half hour is Sarah Jones, editor-in-chief of Politicus USA. Sarah, we're talking about, we were talking about the Virginia governor's race. Uh, both uh, Joe Biden 
uh, I think the big surprise is that I think months ago everybody would have said that uh, Terry McAuliffe was going to win election uh, as governor of Virginia. Uh, but then Joe Biden's popularity draft, and according to the last week's Washington Post poll, he is now as a negative job rating Virginia. How much has that had an impact on the race? You know, I think one of the problems actually that um, they're having in Virginia is that Democrats have not passed Build Back Better yet. I think if Democrats had these, you know, they've done plenty on, on coronavirus, they've done a lot for the American public, but I think people want to see these policies coming through and have something to talk about um, out there on the stump as well. So um, I, I don't know. I have a hard time really seeing that connection with Biden's drop being too. I think this is really about the Republicans uh, doing their fear mongering, which we have seen uh, works so until it's countered. It has to be countered very strongly. And Democrats need to, to focus on turnout in Virginia, just like they did in California, where we saw, you know, that recall uh, looked like it was um, not going to be a good situation for the Democrat. And then at the last minute, uh, uh, Democrats focused on turnout. And what do we have? A repudiation of that um, Republican effort to, you know, use that recall law, which is very uh, badly written um, in California, to their advantage. So uh, I should say that the uh, polling shows that Donald Trump is even is more unpopular uh, right now than Joe Biden in Virginia. Uh, has Trump had an impact on this race? Well, you know, he's wanted to, hasn't he? And he keeps trying to show up. And then Glenn's like, don't come here, you know, yeah, so then, oh, so, you know, don't come. You're a nightmare. Nobody wants you. Um, and I think that's that's what's really amazing to me is that is that Democrats have not managed to stick that Trump stamp on on uh, Yunkin. They need to do that with all the Republicans. I mean, especially with this, you know, what we saw happen on January 6th. These people can't be trusted to govern. So for them to make an issue out of, you know, now it's education, they're going to be, they're defending little children. Uh, this is the first time they've shown up to defend little children in a very long time, by the way. Um, you know, suddenly they care about kids, but only when it is some issue they've created. It isn't even actually an issue yet. No one has ever established that it's actually an issue. So um, Democrats need to do a better job, you know, and, and maybe that's the media's fault. I'm not, you know, I've it could be, could go half and half, really. But you got to tie people to Trump. That's what people understand. This guy we'll, rented himself. We'll uh, find out tomorrow uh, yeah. whether uh, Terry McAuliffe has been successful doing that. Uh, we're going to take another break so we can bring back our radio listeners. Our guest in this half hour is Sarah Jones, editor in chief for Politicus USA. And we come back, we're going to talk about the Supreme Court hearing on the draconian Texas abortion law. We'll be right back. Law to fit your political bias and personal whims. If you don't want to be considered political hacks. Welcome back to Deadline DC with Brad Bannon. Our guest in this segment is Sarah Jones, who is the editor-in-chief of Politicus USA. Uh, we've been talking about the Virginia governor's race. Uh, we're going to talk about the uh, we're going to talk about uh, abortion now. Uh, by the way, for our radio listeners, if you'd like to see us um, as well as hear us, you can watch us on Twitter at uh, www.twitter.com front slash Brad Bannon. You can watch us on Facebook at tinyurl.com front slash BB Facebook Live and on YouTube, tinyurl.com front slash Brad on YouTube. Sarah, today the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, is hearing oral arguments on the Texas abortion law. Uh, please tell uh, us a little bit about uh, why the Texas abortion law has engendered such controversy. Well, the, the law actually stands, uh, as it was written, as a threat to constitutional rights for everyone. And I think that's the part that's probably surprising conservatives a little bit as they've realized the precedent that this law sets. So the court's going to hear arguments from the DOJ and from abortion providers, two separate petitions. They're not hearing um, about the constitutionality of abortion, although they could very well, you know, decide to, to 
make it more broad if they wish. But right now, it's about the the uh, the way the law is enforced. And so the issue with that is that the law is enforced. Um, the enforcement mechanism basically threatens broader constitutional issues um, because. The, the law basically says that the federal courts then cannot review the state uh, law. They can't determine whether or not it's constitutional, so it's allowed to violate constitutional rights. Um, and, and obviously, the DOJ has an issue with that, and then providers as well want to know uh, why constitutional rights can't be reviewed by you know, federal courts. So that's basically what they're going to be looking at. But I think the issue that that law has um, already created an issue for women in Texas, not just women who want to get an abortion, but women who have medical emergencies with pregnancies. There's an atopic pregnancy that can happen. And right now, providers are saying that not only has it had a chilling effect, that providers are afraid to uh, give the care that they know that their patient needs because could be sued and then be you know actually devastated by that the way the law is set up by that lawsuit um, and the fees the, the legal fees and everything else that they would be responsible for so not only that you have to have uh, doctors decide you need this procedure to save your life then lawyers have to agree and then you have to find somebody willing to provide it and that's in the case of a medical emergency so you can imagine that that's not going well I mean it's a terrible uh, predicament to uh, yeah, place. now the Texas law virtually makes it impossible for any woman, uh, even uh, a woman who's in, uh, pregnant as a result of rape or incest, to have an abortion uh, after six weeks. Uh, also, the court's going to also hear oral arguments on December 1st about a Mississippi law uh, which bans abortion after 15 weeks. Now, it seems to me that you have now six conservative justices uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, and do you think uh, they will end up using the tech law um, or the Mississippi law uh, to overturn uh, the landmark uh, abortion rights decision in the case Roe v. Wade. Well, I think they want to. Uh, will they actually do that? I thought your column brought up that interesting point about how this is polling and going over with people, which I don't think they would want to do uh, politically speaking before a midterm that it looks like Democrats are set to kind of mess up anyway. Uh, but, you know, because that would be a, a quite an issue to go to the polls on. And it's not just women. It, it matters to men as well. Um, but uh, the other issue going on with the court that I think is, is why the conservatives may back away. They certainly don't want to. Uh, they certainly don't want to see this Texas law or they shouldn't want to see it go through unchallenged as it is because of the precedent that, you know, other states could go after the right to bear arms. They could go after free speech using the same way that this law was set up. And th so you already see uh, conservatives concerned about that precedent with good reason. Um, so I'm wondering if the justices are going to take that into account. We know that they're concerned about being seen as partisan hacks because uh, they are partisan hacks. Some, several of them are partisan hacks. Um, and so, and it does look like they're not, you know, they let this, this law stand when it was first challenged. They were silent on it. They did nothing for 24 hours, and which is a long time when you think that you're the, the court that's supposed to, you know, make sure that constitutional rights are protected and you're just sitting silent when they're obviously being threatened. Um, so I think the conservative gun group groups are worried about this Texas abortion law. So if the Supreme Court doesn't strike it down, they're afraid that liberals are going to use that same legislation to come after gun ownership. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I uh, hope you're right about that. But the way I look at it, there are now six conservative judges uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Chief Justice, Justice Roberts, is a legal institutionalist, and I doubt whether he would vote to overturn Roe versus Wade, but there are still five other conservative judges uh, who may very well uh, overturn Roe versus Wade, uh, because this may be the only opportunity they have to do it. It's been the conservative 
cause celeb for ever since 1973 when Roe was decided. Uh, what would what would the political impact be if the Supreme Court did overturn uh, Roe versus Wade, either using the Texas law or the Mississippi law as an opportunity to do that? Well, I think that if they're going to do that, they would use the Mississippi law for the reason I just cited yep. earlier, and that's just you know being very cynical about it. But um, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't think this is going to go well for them if they do this. Um, I, it will hurt a lot of people, and a lot of women will have their lives jeopardized by lack of medical care. So I don't want to just say the the political ramifications without noting that it's very important that women's uh, lives are protected as well. It's not right to have them threatened. I do think that this is a big issue for Republicans. If they overturn Roe versus Wade, they're going to find out that all of those white women in the suburbs that they think are their voters don't support that. A lot of mothers don't support forcing people to have children and they also want the right to you know do in vitro and all these other issues that come up from these laws so i think it would be um politically speaking a gift to democrats but to the country quite devastating and to women absolutely you know life-threatening yeah uh okay i'm gonna put you on the spot here like leslie does when i'm on her show uh <laughs> who do you think's gonna win in virginia tomorrow oh god I don't do these things. I don't do predictions because, you know, my emotional side of me is always thinking that Democrats are going to lose and very afraid of another Trump person coming in. But um, if I had to guess, if you're going to make me guess, which I really don't like doing, but if, if Democrats get turnout, I think that McAuliffe will pull this out. Okay. I think okay. he'll pull it off. Uh, but we're going to leave it there, and I think you already predicted that the court is going not going to overturn Roe versus Wade. So we'll probably have an op another opportunity to talk about that. That's it for this segment of Deadline DC. We'll be back after these messages. I want to thank our guest, Sarah Jones, editor in chief hey, Dad, of Politica. How USA. do airplanes fly? Thank you so much.